اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي ليس لاوليته ابتداء ولا لازليته انقضاء وانحصرت الاوصاف عن كنه معرفته وردعت عظمته العقول والذي لا تواري عنه سماء سماء ولا ارض ارضا ثم الصلاه والسلام والتحيه والاكرام على سيد البطحاء سيد المرسلين والانبياء ابي القاسم محمد المصطفى وعلى الجوهرة القدسية البتول العذراء سيدة النساء فاطمة الزهراء وعلى بعلها أمير المؤمنين وبنيها الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا لا سيما على بقية الله وحجته الكبرى الذي بيمنه رزق الورى وبوجوده ثبتت الأرض والسماء ولو الله لصاخت الأرض بأحلها واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من حين عداوتهم إلى قيام يوم الدين اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وان منكم الا واردها كان على ربك حتما مقضيا ثم ننجي الذين اتقوا ونذر الظالمين فيها جسيا صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد It's our responsibility as believers to hold ourselves accountable and if we don't then we will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Those people who hold themselves accountable themselves in this life the way we are supposed to hold ourselves accountable then we will be exempt and we are entitled to enter the paradises and the gardens without the accountability we did talk about some of those categories of people who deserve to enter without accountability and also some of those categories of people who will enter the hellfire without the accountability now another station in the day of judgment that deserves our attention in terms of holding ourselves accountable before we reach that stage is the station called asrat the bridge and this has been mentioned in the holy quran in these ayat of holy quran surah maryam which i recited wa in minkum illa wariduha there isn't any one of you but he has to come to it that means the hell fire كان على ربك حتما مقضيا this is something confirmed unavoidable and decreed upon by Allah by your lord so this is something which is it simply cannot be avoided is a confirmed decision of Allah that all have to come towards the hell 
And after that, Surah Maryam says, Thumma nunajjil ladheena taqaw. Then we are going to save those who did taqwa. وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ fiha jisiya, And we'll leave the oppressors there on their knees. The oppressors who did oppressions in this world, while they will be crossing the bridge of fire, will not be walking on the bridge. Instead, they will be crawling over their knees. We learn very obviously in the light of these verses of, the, of Surah Maryam that all of us, all the humans would be crossing over the bridge. There isn't anyone amongst you except it will, but he has to come to it. That's what I mentioned if you remember in one of the previous speeches that the bridge of Sarat is crossing over the hellfire. Some of the scholars of Tafsir say it through the hellfire. So it's the bridge which is crossing over the hell and everyone has to cross. In the Tafsir of Qurtabi, it has been mentioned in the Tafsir about this verse, Summa Nunajjil Ladina Taqaw, then we will save the ones who did taqwa. The tafsir says, Alladheena taqaw ash-shirk. Those who will be, those who back then in the life of dunya were protecting themselves from the shirk are the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save. So taqwa, this is what our scholars say, that Basically, Jahannam and Hellfire is Jahannam of Shahawat, is the Naru Shahawat. And Jannat, the paradise, is actually Jannatu Taqwa. Hellfire is the place of our desires. And heaven is the place of our abstinence. How much we were powerful, strong enough to control our inclinations and whims and wishes. When we want to do something and our desires are misleading us towards doing something, which as a matter of fact the desires always mislead the person, there is no human being on the planet who can claim that my desires are pure. Then it's not called desires. What is pure was already added in the Sharia. Anything that was pure and beneficial that would end up in your support, in your help, that's going to elevate you, make you close to Allah, purify your soul, benefit you in any regard, is already made part of the Sharia because Allah is our creator, He loves us. He would either make that ruling become wajib, if it's a really beneficial thing, or He would have made it mustahab, recommended act. Isn't it right? So anything that would have any sort of benefit for you and your spirituality and your body as well, Islam has rulings not only for the soul but for the body as well, would have been made part of the Sharia. So if you find there is any of your desires, you know, anything that you want to do and you think that it's very good, it's nice, there's nothing wrong about it, you must understand this is how shaitan is misleading us. Because none, in, none of our desires are pure and none of our desires are beneficial. That's the definition of human desires. And in the tafsir, of Ahlul Bayt salam, we learn that Sirat is actually nothing but the Imam of your time. The hadith says, As Siratul Mustaqim Ali Yubn Abi Talib. Allahumma
Muhammad, Muhammad. That's the real meaning of Sarat. We have been talking about so much about the bridge, isn't it? What's the straight path of Allah? Straight path of Allah is nothing but the walayat of Ahlul Bayt salam, which is the walayat of Rasulullah, which is the walayat and authority and governance and supremacy of Allah Himself over ourselves. So the question that we need to have, that's what they say, see the, the, the narration says As-Sirat siratane there are two Sirat, two bridges one Sirat in dunya and a Sirat in akhirat the Sirat in dunya is nothing but the Imam that's the Walayat of the Imam under whose Imamat you are surviving, you are living the Imam of your time Today is the walayat of Imam Sahib Zaman Ajjalullahu Ta'ala Farajah al Sharif. This is what we need to ask ourselves. Well, what am I doing towards the walayat of my Imam? Is the supremacy of Allah, is Allah ruling over me? And whenever I want to do something, I need to think what did Allah say about it? What did Imam Sahib al Zaman say about it? What would make him be pleased with me? For everything, if for everything and every choice and every intersection of our life we think on those lines, what would Imam Sahib Zaman say if I do that? Or think about me if I do that? What pleases him and what displeases him? That would prove that, that salam, the walayat of the Imam of my time is ruling over my soul, not my desires. And if you don't allow the walayat of the Imam of your time to rule over soul, you never practice. You never were on the straight path back then in the life of dunya. And whatever you did, whatever you practiced, whatever you believed back then in the life of dunya would appear in the form of the bridge on the akhirat. So akhirat, like I said earlier, three or four speeches away, there's nothing new going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Nothing new is going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Day of Judgment is a day where all the hidden realities that were hidden back then in dunya over me because of my ignorances would now be apparent, appear upon me. Not that it is going to happen today, no. It has already happened. My soul will already burn with my desires and worshipping my wishes. Now I would end up discovering that I already have a burnt soul. Those who obeyed the Imam of the time, they already enlightened, illuminated their souls with the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would end up discovering that our soul is already illuminous. Already illuminous. Not that this is going to happen there. That's a, that's a misstatement, misrepresentation of the facts of Quran. If someone says that the, the reward, the nuraniyat of the qalb, the, the paradise and the hellfire will be, will be made available only on the day of judgment and is not available right now. When we believe it's available right now, then we must, we will also end up believing that when it's a hellfire is there, <laughs> then it's not a decoration piece, isn't it right? Paradise is there right now, it's not a decoration piece. What, it, what benefit it has to do with my life? The benefit or harm is as follows. If I do a sin, I get burnt straight away. That's the benefit of keeping the hellfire right now for the humanity, isn't it right? And the benefit of heaven is that we get the, the, in the noor of our obediences into our spirituality right now. That's the benefit of having the, hell, the heaven right now. So now because of our behaviors, how we practiced back then in the life of dunya, so we will be crossing, it will appear Allah doesn't, Allah doesn't need to find out how we did we behave. He already knows. He knew before the creation of the universe how each and every particle would behave. Isn't it right? We were ignorant and the rest of the humans were ignorant. Isn't it right? Except those who, the prophets and the imams. Isn't it right? So we were ignorant, the humanity was ignorant, it would, it would become clear upon us, the sinners or the good doers, 
and it would become clear upon the rest of the humanity why is Allah sending this individual to the heaven and this individual to the hell upon Allah it was clear already and now people are reaching this place there, there's a unique kind of bridge never seen before you know thinner than the hair of a human being and sharper than the edge of the sword how thin is the hair of a human being isn't it right you cannot even think of walking over the hair isn't it right but that's what we are walking right now every single moment of our life and the way we are walking and practicing the you know the walayat of the imam of our time in making choices of life at every intersection that's the way we are walking the fine line isn't it right so this is how we make a fine line you go to the workplace you have to shake up hand with the non mahram person isn't it right you have to make a choice what shall i do isn't it right you have to tell a lie to somebody just to make more money or if you end up deceiving someone for when you're selling a product or you end up doing hasad and envy towards a fellow you know mu'min brother or sister or you end up doing ghibat or backbiting the way we are making these choices every moment of our life this is how we are treading the path which is thinner than the hair avoiding the harams and keeping ourselves at a distance from all the harams and walking the thin and fine line this is how Allah will make it clear upon us and the rest of the humanity that this guy was walking like this it's sharper than the edge of the sword ahaddu min as-saif wa azlamu min al-layl darker than the night now we have narration from um, from Kitab al Amali of Sheikh Saduq Rahmanullah, peace say salawat. <laughs> Where we find that uh, the speeds are mentioned. Sheikh Saduq in this narration uh, from Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam <laughs> says. <laughs> Look at the categories of people walking over Sarat. We're talking about how we need to hold ourselves accountable, muhasaba towards the station called Sarat. Minhum man yamurru mislal barq. Among the humanity, there are some people who who walk over it. That means walk over the bridge like the flash of a lightning, a lightning flash, so fast. Isn't it right? This is how some people will walk like this. Well, they are the ones who are walk, used to walk over the Sarat, making those correct decisions at every stage of their life back then in the life of them. That's how they were walking. They were leading the way towards the rest of the people. Isn't it right? When we are walking on the Sarat, what my teacher Ayatullah Jawadi Amuli Hafadahullah said that we, while walking on a straight path, we are supposed to have take lead and subcut over the rest of the individuals you need to take a lead over the rest of the individuals that if you know we we should be first of all we avoid laziness and do tasarro and surat be fast remove laziness in your behavior grow up behave like grown-up individuals isn't it right so we learn what Allah has said and his wahi and his sharia on the greatest soul which is this sharia and these laws are nasikh li sharai they are invalidating towards all the previous legislatures that allah has provided nothing can supersede this sharia this is the most perfect complete and final word which can never be invalidated when we have those kinds of highest possible laws for our success now we need to learn those laws asap instead of learning those laws in, in a time when we get 75 years of age or 80 years old i never read in my life that when a, a 80 year old person elderly person is saying salatul layl you know night prayers namaz shab allah would say to his angels look at how my servant is doing so good i never read anywhere in my life but there is a narration when a young man, a young boy, a youth, he is reciting the night prayers, Allah says to his angels, look at the hal, the condition of this, this person in other words, and be a witness that I have forgiven him. 
So if you do the similar obediences, how would you do those obediences? When you gain the knowledge. Step number one in Islam starts by learning the rulings of the Sharia. Before your daughter reaches the age of Islamic maturity, it's your responsibility as a father and second of all as a mother, primarily the, the, primarily the responsibility of father to teach your daughter before she reaches the age of Islamic maturity all the wajibat and information about all the haram so she can avoid it. Starting from Tawheed, proving it with the logical evidences. Isn't it right? Prophet is walking by in a village, in a, in a desert, you know, and uh, there's an elderly lady who is running the hand mill, grinding the wheat, grinding. And Prophet asks him, her about the Tawheed. And she says, she's an ignorant lady, isn't it right? Desert dwelling person. I don't know, schools or universities or colleges there. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, all I know is that when I move this hand mill, it, it rotates. And if I you know, keep my hand away, it's the wind, this whole big stone of the windmill stops moving. So when I stop it, the, this whole stone, grinding stone stops moving. Now how in the world the whole universe can run successfully without a Lord who is running it? Who is running the whole show? She was an, you know, an ignorant lady living in the desert. For the person like her, this kind of evidence is acceptable. But if a person like you living in the Los Angeles metropolitan area is in a right having access to all those information um, sources, <laughs> obviously you need to have evidences. You need to have evidences that are, uh, you know, suitable to your case. It should not happen that your daughter or son doesn't know why we believe in Allah. At least two of the mothers in, in America have contacted me personally that my, our children have denied the existence of Allah. First hand information, they contact, contacted me directly. Two mothers. Since my child started learning the evolution through it, theory, he denied the existence of Allah. So these are very important issues that we, we are not talking about something theoretical or metaphorical or you know. No, these are very, very important issues touching our lives on daily, almost daily basis or not almost, on really on daily basis. Tawheed reflects in every aspect of a believer's personality. So your son and daughter must be empowered to know why we believe in 12 Imams. What in the world do I benefit in believing in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What if I don't learn about why Allah is Rahman and why Allah is all powerful, why Allah is all wise, why Allah is all knowing? What if I don't bother to learn all that? Is there a difference in my life? Does my son know the difference? If he knows the difference, his lifestyle would change. His choices of life would change. Isn't it right? This is why you find the ignorances. This is why you find the ignorances found in the Usul al-Deen reflects in the Furuddin matters. The ignorances found in the belief system are bound to reflect in your actions and deeds because deeds and beliefs are inseparable from each other. Amir al has said in Nahjul Balagha Bil a'mala yustadallu ala salihat wa bil salihat tustadallu ala al-eeman Bil iman yustadallu ala salihat wa bil salihat tustadallu ala al-eeman So you understand, you uh, realize, you discover the faith of a person through his deeds and his deeds, deeds of a person through his faith he, If he has faith, in other words, if he has the iman there he would definitely end up doing the actions in sync with that Iman. And if he has the actions, this shows he had the Iman. That's why he did those actions. You never find a person doing all those obediences of Allah without, you know, recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason why we find there's a loose behavior because there's a loose Iman. There's a vacuum in the faith. So what I was telling you is that 
what I was telling you is that that there are people who are walking the straight path, the, this bridge of Sirat on the Day of Judgment with the flash of a lightning. And that's what my teacher said. When we are walking the straight path in the life of this dunya, we have a responsibility to remove the idle behavior, remove your laziness and learn, be quick in learning the Islamic knowledge. So you start walking in the straight path. Avoid the, the choices of Jahannam. The first step is Surat. Sari'u. Quran says, my teacher said, Quran says, Sari'u ila maghfiratim min rabbikum. Duty number one is Surat. You really need to be quick. Life is running out. Time is really too short. We never know when we would die. Isn't it right? The second step is Sabqat. Taking a lead over the rest of the individuals, believers who are alongside yourself walking on the straight path. You need to take a lead over the rest. Quran says, Fastabiqul Khairat. This ayat is the evidence that we need to take a lead over the rest. And then my teacher said the responsibility number three is Imamat. Taking doing the job of leadership for the community who can do the leadership somebody who's lacking behind <laughs> definitely not leader has to stand in the front ahead of the rest so that's why so when quran says wajalna lil muttaqina imama make us the li the the imam of the pious my teacher says this dua of the holy quran belongs to the sabiqeen only those people who have successfully taken a lead over the rest of the believers in walking the thin line, the fine line of the straight path and making the correct choices all the way through. And they got so fast, they took a lead over the rest and they are walking ahead of the rest. Only they have the right to lead. <laughs> So Sarat al Mustaqim has triple responsibilities on our neck. Surat, be quick, learn your, the knowledge, learn your shari obligations, isn't it right? Be quick in becoming a human, behave like a human. Anyone who ignores the rulings and values and principles of the Creator is behaving worse as an animal. Even animal doesn't do that. You can't find any animal in the animal kingdom that misbehaves towards the Creator's command. Isn't it right? The common example we always give, you can hold a carrot in front of a tiger, wait for a million years and it would never consume. It would die of hunger but never consume because the Creator commanded the tiger what to eat and what not. There's zero disobedience in Alam al Tiger is part of Alam al not Alam al Tashri, the world of legislature that we humans and jinns are part of that. Isn't that right? And you can hold the meat and flesh in front of the horse and you can keep waiting for a million years and a horse may die out of hunger but not disobey the command of the Creator. It only consumes what Allah sanctioned for it. That's it. But they are human beings who are consuming quote-unquote consuming their fellow human beings in the frame name of democratization of the Middle East killing more than a million people collateral damage killing civ innocent civilians isn't it right we care about the innocent civilians isn't it right in the Zibba, the share that Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam recited In the Zibba yatruko lahma zibbin wa yakulu ba'dhuna ba'dhan ayana That's the share of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib Salam, which was recited by him and also repeated by Imam Ar-Rida alayhi salam so this is also now part of the hadith of the Masoom. Isn't it right? When the Masoom says something, it says hadith. It's authentic. It's authenticated by the Masoom. That's what it means. Isn't it right? In the Zi'ba, Yatruku Lahma Zi'bim. A wolf leaves the meat of another wolf. 
Whereas some of us are eating, consuming some of others. Isn't it right? That's how the humans are. So anyone who is still not open, opened up towards learning and behaving according to the values and principles of the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behaving worse than the animals. Step number one is be quick in learning. Step two, take a lead, sabqat, lead over the rest. And when you have successfully taken a lead over the rest, you are the one who deserve to do that dua of the Holy Quran. وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, Make us the imam and leader of the pious. Now you deserve to lead the rest of the pious people because you have taken lead over them in doing the khairat and good deeds. Not those who are lacking behind. Today I do five harams, tomorrow I do ten, then I go do seven harams, then I do five. Business as usual. As if I'm a child. I still I'm engaged in lahab and laib and harams and stuff. <laughs> Behaving like a childish behavior towards Allah. And when in the world would we grow up? And behave like a grown-up individuals. Once and for all discover how we were supposed to lead our life. Isn't it right? This is why the speeds of people walking over the bridge of Sirat are different. Some, the first category, Sheikh Saduq narrates from our sixth Imam, Minhum man yamurru mislal bark. Some of them would be, some of them passing like a flash. Wa minhum man yamurru misla adwil faras. Some of them will be uh, moving like the running of a horse. That means it's fast. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمُرُّ حَبْوًا Some of them would be crawling over their knees. So that back then, these people were crawling over knees, isn't it right? When they were treading the straight path, that was their, you know, their choices. They couldn't even stand up straight in their life. <laughs> they couldn't even stand up straight. This is what I call childish behavior. Isn't the child who crawls in the early age, isn't it right? This guy behaved like a child in front of the values and principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sharia. He was behaving like a child. So now he deserves to crawl there. You may be 95 years old, but you would be crawling. And then Imam uh, uh, salam says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمُرُّ مَشْيًا Among them would be the one who would be walking, uh, you know, crossing it in a walking situation. This guy is not fast. No, he's just walking a regular walk. He walked back then in dunya. Now he's walking here. Isn't it right? وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمُرُّ مُتَعَلِّقًا قَدْ تَأْخُذُ النَّارُ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا وَتَتْرُكُ شَيْئًا And among them will be somebody who would be, you know, when he would be crossing over the bridge, the hellfire, he, he would be hanging. He would be hanging over the bridge of Sarat that the hellfire flames would take away part of his flesh, part of his existence and leave the rest. Right? All those uh, things that we did. You know, remember the ayat of Holy Quran where Allah says, Inna rabbaka labil mirsad. So about this verse of Holy Quran, we have the hadith of tafsir of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Definitely your Lord is at Mirsad. In other words, so Imam Islam says, Al Mirsadu Qantaratun ala Sirat. Mirsad is a crossing, is a bridge over Sirat. La Yajuzuha Abdun bi Mazlamatin. No person can cross over it who has a zulm on on him. If you have done zulm on somebody, some sort of zulm on somebody, you simply cannot cross over that. So unless and until the, hell, the hellfire takes the revenge. Now the person will be hanging, he cannot move forward. He's stuck. Hellfire is now taking the revenge from that person. As much zulm as he or she has done back then in the life of dunya, that's uh, the hellfire is going to take away that much of your body, you know, and burn it away. And uh, this is how the reward has been taken. After crossing the Sirat, that's where, why is Sirat that important? 
The stage of Sirat is important after you end up crossing the bridge of Sirat. That's where is the division that people will then be going towards the heaven, the paradise. And our scholars say that in, in tafsir they have mentioned the reason why Allah allowed everyone to cross over the bridge of Sirat, which is over the hellfire or through it, even including the good doers. The reason why Allah asked all of them to cross over it, so now they end up realizing the, the greatness of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please say salawat. <laughs> now we would value the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't it right? Otherwise it's very difficult for people to value. You know, they won't realize what's the value. And this is how we find it's, uh, you know, uh, obviously one of the benefits of, uh, uh, of realizing that is that we will, we will, we will change our, our, our behaviors towards that. The reason why we don't change, some of the people don't change the behaviors because obviously they are in, uh, they are not Ahlul Yaqeen, they are Ahlul Shak. Just like the story of Harisa ibn Malik in, in the book Al-Kafi, the Prophet saw this, this person, those people surrounding him and Prophet inquired and he was told that this person says that he is Ahlul Yaqeen. He has Yaqeen and certitude. And Prophet asked about the alamat and sign. Obviously every reality has a sign. You can prove that, that through the sign. So what's the sign of the you know, Yaqeen, being Ahlul Yaqeen, being one of those who have Yaqeen and certitude? What's the sign? And uh, Prophet said, you know, asked about the sign once and he replied that I can see the people of hell burning in the hell fire right now. And I, I can see the people of the paradise benefiting from the blessings of Allah right now. This is something he can see because he doesn't have those hijabat, isn't it right? He's Ahlul Yaqeen. When somebody is Ahlul Yaqeen, he can witness all those things right now. <laughs> That's where the Holy Prophet replied, Abdun Nawwarallahu Qalbahu. He is that a servant whose qalb and soul has been illuminated by the Lord. Allah has provided nur to his qalb. Please say salawat. <laughs> These teachings of the Sharia, you know, provide the nur, and there are some people, there are some people who, you know, uh, who underestimate the highness of the teachings of the Sharia. When the same Sharia was revealed on the Holy Prophet's soul, isn't it right? He was shivering. This is the only the greatness of the soul of Rasulullah, who can withstand the greatness of the Sharia in its entirety that's his soul and he comes to his wife Hazrat Khadija alayha, asks her to you know to provide a cloth so he can wrap himself up with that cloth and when he wrapped himself with that cloth this verse of Holy Quran was revealed on the occasion of Bi'sat when Prophet was officially commanded by Allah to start his propagation Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir Oh, you who is the clothed one, the one who has been clothed, arise and warn. Now, Prophet has received the Sharia. He's, he's supposed to warn other people. Isn't it right? Quran did not say, arise, rise up and give glad tidings and basharat to the people. And this is what some people say why you always talk about inzar and warning the people? Well, because Quran, our Muhassirin say, Quran most of the times is talking about Inzar and less of the times is talking about the Basharat and glad tidings. So let's go according to the policy of Quran and the Prophet. Our scholars say if Prophet would have said to the masses, Hey guys, you know, if you stop telling the lie, you will be rewarded in paradise. If you don't do ghibat, you'll be rewarded. If you tell the truth, you'll be rewarded. People would have replied to the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, you know what, we respect you, but we don't want to, we don't need, we don't care about the rewards there and the, and on the Day of Judgment. We want the rewards right now, here in this world. 
Is that right? This is our paradise. We just want to live with freedom, quote unquote. Freedom, the Western style. Do whatever you wish to do. Is that right? Break away from the law of the Creator. Violate the law of the Creator in the name of freedom. Freedom to violate the law of the Lord. Isn't it right? That's what the people would have said definitely to the Holy Prophet. But when you are talking about the Inzar, you are warning them about the punishments, so there is no room for them to escape. If you trust him, which even the idol worshippers burying their daughters alive used to trust him. Call him Sadiq and Ameen. So Inzar can never be escaped. Basharat is usually escaped by most of the people. Because that's what our scholars say, the majority of those human beings who are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are obeying Allah because of his fear of the hell. And there, there's a very less minority of the believers and obedient people and pious people who are obeying and doing this piety because they want the reward. There is a very small, tiny minority. And there are, there are really precious, precious few people only on the footsteps of Prophet and Ahlul Bayt who are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just because they consider Allah to be deserving of worship. Just like Amir Mu'mineen has said, Ilahi ma abadtuka khawf min narik wala tama'an fi jannatik. Oh my Lord, I didn't worship you in the, for the scare of your hell, nor did I worship you for the greed of your reward, your paradise. Bal wajadtuka ahlan lil ibadate fa abadtuk. Instead, I find you deserving for worship, so I worshipped you. How many people are like this? So this is this is the benefit to talk about the inzar and warning. That's the policy of Quran in most of the verses, and that's the policy of um, uh, you know of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. And then, as we are discussing the accountability towards the station of Sirat, our scholars say even warning about Jahannam is Jahan, even the creation of Jahannam itself is a rahmat and mercy of Allah because that's how we get warned, that's how we get straightened, that's how we get corrected and Jahannam is also serving as a mercy towards the pious people pious people who have been oppressed by the oppressors you know, it's a mercy upon the pious that their oppressors get punished. This is how you have to, you know, soothe and comfort those who were in, kept in pain by the oppressors. This is, how, this is how you would comfort those who were oppressed. Isn't it right? By serving justice. If you don't serve the justice, you can never heal the wound of those who have been hurt. Isn't it right? So Jahannam, don't interpret Jahannam to be a negative entity. Jahannam and Hellfire is also a positive entity and also from these perspectives serves as a rahmat and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have narration from Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas saying that Sirat has seven bridges and the first one is relating Iman. The thing that we emphasize, that I emphasize in the beginning of my speech, our behavior towards the walayat and imamat of the time, imam of the time, that's what relates to the iman. How did I behave towards that? Or was I siding towards the enemies of Ahlul Bayt salam, supporting the enemies or sympathizing the enemies, or even having a soft corner towards what the enemies and the enemies of Ahlul Bayt salam, and the enemies of Imam Mahdi salam, are doing, if I have a soft corner towards that. This is also relating to the same concept of Iman. And the second thing is the second bridge over on Sirat is oh, well, the second bridge in, the, in Jahannam. Jahannam has seven bridges and the second bridge, the first one is Iman and the second one is the Salat. Prayers. How much importance we hold for the Salat in our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to hold um, importance for the Salat and try our best to pray in the beginning time. You know, Ayatollah Shir Jafar Shustari uh, said that even on the day of Ashura, uh, not a single mustahab recommended act was left out by Imam Al-Husayn
not a single mustahab thing of the Sharia. You can, you can start counting the mustahab thing and you'll see how Imam Hussain was even performing the mustahab. If a little bit some, you know, panic happens in our life or we go through some sort of little bit trouble of a very ordinary average level, you find people, sinners like me, we start losing our mustahab things. Isn't that right? Some people lose their wajibs as well. But even the mustahab things were not dropped and even the waqt of fadilat of the prayers was never missed for a moment. For never, never missed for even a moment. This is the azamat of Imam al Hussein al Islam. So we find that um, 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 a per prophet, was, a prophet saw a person who was doing prayers like this, you know. Some people nakarak or nakaril ghurab. Putting your just like you see, if you seen a crow, you know, picking up things and putting his beak over the ground so many times, just how a person was praying, so fast, messing up with his wajibs. When Prophet saw this guy praying like that, in that pattern, he said, "If he dies, he won't die on my religion." If a person doesn't even know, you know, <laughs> how to pray, and this kind of praise is what he performs. This person definitely is not going to die. Mm, Prophet said, if you die with this salat, with this prayers, you're not going to die on my religion. So this is uh, Ayatullah Khunsari, one of our great orofa in the history. This is how see, these stories have a lesson for us when we talk about the great personalities. Ayatullah Khunsari was one of the you know, very unique and very high level pious personalities of our great history. And he's the one who performed his own prayers of his life. He repeated the prayers of his own life three times in his life. Just for the sake of ihtiyat, so I don't mess up with any prayers and why I meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my prayers are done rightfully and properly. Please say salawat. And the third bridge on Jahannam is the bridge of uh, Zakat. Zakat and Khums, how we behave towards the Islamic taxes. Isn't that right? You know, one person comes to, uh, some people came to Imam Rida and asked him to make them exempt from paying the Khums. <coughs> How about that? You are asking the Imam himself. Now first of all, you know, first of all, this is the haqq that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has sanctioned. And this is something which is, um, you know, this is something that we have to uh, pay towards, to qurbatan illallah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Rida alayhi salam, according to the narration, he said three times that I, I am not going to make it halal for none of you. He repeated three times. And in another hadith we find that Imam As-Sadiq says that when somebody asks that what is the minimum, what is the minimum with which a person can land him in the hell? And Imam salam replied, eating up the money of orphan. And he said, then he said, Nahnal al yatim we are the orphan. If we, you, that means if you eat up the khums, if you don't pay the obligation that we have towards uh, the Ahlul Bayt salam, then you can understand this is how the destiny has been clearly mentioned. And the narration also tells us that when the angel of death, Malakul Maut, comes towards a person who never paid his khums in zakat, so zakat is applicable for those nine things which are usually found in the villages. So usually we don't talk about zakat. Those scholars who go to the villages, they talk about zakat because we don't have the, you know, the cattle and the camels and sheep and cow and all that here in the, in the cities. So Islamic taxes, be it zakat or khums, a person who dies without paying those Islamic taxes, the angel of death says to him, Mut Yehudiyan aw Nasraniya. You die as a Jew or a Christian. Tell me, you're not going to die as a Muslim. You're going to die as a Jew or a Christian. So this, this shows the importance of the concept of paying the haqq of Ahlul Bayt towards the Ahlul Bayt and paying that 
yeah, properly. And first of all, to begin with, this is not even our money. The Quran has already said, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Isn't it right? The, those people give away from what we have provided as risk to them. What, the risk that Allah provided to them. So it's Allah's risk, it's not ours in, in, the, in the real sense if we realize. Please say salawat. This is how um, it, uh, you know, it, 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 is, it is that important. And uh, uh, when you spend for the sake of Allah, then you spend, because right now we are in the month of Muharram, where commonly, Alhamdulillah, the Mu'mineen and Mu'minat spend so much in the love of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. This is one of the great values of ours and we are proud to spend our money for the sake of Imam Hussain and for the sake of his love. Isn't it right? But make sure that when we are spending the money, it is the money which is pure and purified. It should not be the money which is impure. You can never spend an impure money for a pure cause because that's not going to be accepted. Imam al Hussain who is the Markaz of Taharat, he is the central point of cleanliness. And Ayatul Tathir, the, world, the verse about the pure, pure, the, the pure status of Ahlul Bayt is revealed about these five personalities when it was revealed. Isn't it right? We cannot think of paying from the haram income in the, in the love of Imam Hussain al-Islam. It doesn't work like this. This cannot be accepted. It is actually an insult if you bring for a pure and purified person, you bring the najis money to give, them a, give him as a gift. Isn't that insult? Somebody who distanced himself throughout his life from everything najis. And we are presenting a gift to him. And when you bring food for, in the love of Imam Hussain, you are actually gifting it to Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli Muhammad we need to make sure that we are present, uh, presenting something which is pure and tayyib. Min tayyibat ima. Isn't it right? Quran talks about tayyibat. We need to give away from the tayyibat of what Allah has provided us, not from khabisat. There is no tasadduq and sadaqah given from khabisat. This is what we find that if we have pure intention towards the Ahlul Bayt and if we have pure actions and pure money spent for the sake of Allah, you do find there is always rewards. There was a story one teacher was telling that one person, his father was leaving for the ziyarat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. This son didn't have the money. And he said to his dad, I wish I could accompany with you to, for the ziyarat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, but I don't have the money. He went back to his store, dad left with the caravan, he went back to his shop, he was a poor guy with a small shop. And he find on the same time a person came, brought some expensive commodity for him and gave him, he said, I don't have the money to buy that from you. He said, no, keep that and sell it and you pay me back after you make money. And he gets that commodity from this rich person and all of a sudden, arrangement from Allah and arrangement from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, a buyer arrives immediately to buy that expensive commodity. And he made the, so much money that he shut down his shop and he rushed and he found the same caravan of his dad. It hadn't gone far away. Can you imagine how much they are ready to pay back to us if we have pure intention towards Imam Hussein alayhi salam? This is what it counts. They buy purity and ikhlas. They themselves are pure. And they distance themselves from najasat. And the love of money and the attachment towards money is, is the biggest najasat. And the love of dunya and attachment towards its material belonging is the biggest possible najasat. Bigger than any najasat outside. Biggest possible najasat inside the soul. That blocks us from all those good deeds. And this is what we find the purity, they buy ikhlas. If you remember that story, one of the teachers of Hawza had told that uh, you know, a great Arif person, a great scholar, he went for the ziyarat of Abu Fadl Abbas salam. And when he went there, the haram in those days used to be shut down sooner. 
Nowadays they keep it open, alhamdulillah, throughout the night. In those days they used to shut down the haram sooner. And uh, the servant there at the door, they, he was just shutting down the door and he didn't let this scholar go in. And he said, there's just one lady inside, I'm just asking her to leave as well. And this scholar returns back, isn't it right? <laughs> so uh, you cannot force the people, it's just like we don't uh, push the people while reaching the zari. There are some people who just because they didn't reach the zari, they start pushing the people aside. You cannot do a haram for the sake of doing some sort of recommended or mustahab act. Isn't it right? This is, this is wrong. You cannot push the people so you can test the dhari. Or some sort of good action. This is how some silly people are. You are pushing ten mu'mineen just to kiss the dhari. You think you are going to get close to Imam Hussain by doing haram towards ten mu'min brothers and sisters? So, he returns back to his... Uh, you know, so his place and he goes to sleep and that's where he saw that dream which I once mentioned in your city. Isn't it right? And he sees in the dream that this Mu'mina was there, the one about whom the, the servant of the Haram was talking about. This Mu'mina is there in the Haram Abu Fadl Abba He's He's an Arif scholar. He, you know, they don't have those curtains. So he saw that this lady is asking for the shifa and cure of his son from the sickness. Asking that from Abu al-Fazl Abbas al-Islam to give him shifa and cure from that illness. And he's this, this great scholar he saw in the dream that and there's a Nurani gathering and Prophet is sitting there. And Amir al-Mu'mineen is uh, Prophet is available. Amir al-Mu'mineen is also available there. Imam, you know, Imam al Hussein is also, you know, this gathering, Amir Mumineen is there, and there are angels there, you know, apart from the Prophet and Amir Mumineen, there are several angels who are standing in front of, of Rasulullah. And at that occasion, he finds that one of the angels come inside this Nurani gathering, and, and he says that Abu al Fazl Abbas sends salam to you, says to the Holy Prophet. And after the salam, he says that he is asking that you do the dua to, her, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of the son of that lady who arrived at his dari. Prophet did the dua and the response came that, you know, this son is destined to die. That means the shifa and cure cannot be given. Look at the azamat of Abu al-Fazl Abbas in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How great is Abu al-Fazl Abbas alayhi salam. And the angel went away. And after a while, this Arif scholar, he's seeing in the dream, he saw the angel is sent again by Abu al-Fazl Abbas. He comes again into the same Nurani gathering and he repeats the same to the Holy Prophet. And Prophet seeks the dua once again and the similar answer comes back from Allah's behalf. And he, the angel goes away and tells the answer to Abu al-Fazl Abbas. And now this scholar sees in the dream that now Abu al-Fazl Abbas himself comes to see the Holy Prophet in the same situation the way he died with the arrow poked into his eye and he's bleeding and he's injured and without the two hands available in the same situation Abu Salabas shows up in front of Rasulullah and he says that to say to Allah that either remove the title of Abu al of Babu al-Hawa'id, the door towards the acceptance of the prayers of the people, either remove that title away from me or give the shifa and cure to the son of this lady. This is how we find the reply comes back from Allah that the title of Babu al-Hawa'id will not be taken away from Abbas. Allah has given the Shifa to that the son of the lady. Look at the highness of Abu Abbas. This Arif scholar comes back and he meets again the, the, the person at the door of the haram and tells that servant, tells the servant to tell the lady that your son has already been given shifa. So please come back from the dari, come out of the haram. This is how the situation of Abu Abbas is. How dear he is towards Allah. How dear to is Imam Hussain when he comes towards Imam Hussain to seek the permission for jihad? Imam is not giving the permission. 
You know, it's so hard for the Imam to give, to allow permission towards a great brother like Abbas. That's not easy. Imam replies back to uh, Abu Fazl Abbas, Anta Hamilun Liwa'i. You are the carrier of my flag. In other words, you are the commander in chief of this army. Imam Abbas looks towards the, you know, the right and the left, towards the both sides, and then says to the Mawla, Where is that army? Where are those people, in other words, for whom I am leading? That means there is no one else left. So, Abul Fazl Abbas is being, being given the permission now to go and bring water for Sakina bint al Hussein for Sakina. Now, he comes and towards the tent and grabs the leather water back from Sakina. And now, Abbas salam is heading towards the Farat. You know, obviously, you know, the children have been so thirsty, raising their voice of Al-Atash, Al-Atash, or oh, thirst, or oh, thirst, because they were so thirsty since days. And now, they are so much encouraged that now our uncle Abbas is going to get the water. They are so much hopeful to now get the water. When he reaches into the Farad, after doing his brave battle there, and we find... He takes his horse right into the river and takes the water into his hand and recalls Sakaina bint al Hussein at that time. He did not drink the water. May our souls be sacrificed for the wafa and faithfulness of Abu al Abbas. You had access to drinking the water, but you did not drink the water because Sakina is thirsty, because Imam al Hussein is thirsty. Look at the highness and other mouth of Abbas. He comes back, he fills up the leather water bag and comes back towards the Khiyam, towards the Khaymah of Sakina. And we find the enemy. Enemy is there surrounding, almost surrounding Abu al Abbas. One enemy comes forward and he chops the right hand of Abu al Abbas. He didn't let go of the water bag. He grasped the whole water bag with his left arm so he can at least take some water towards Sakina who is waiting for him and now when the arrow is thrown when the we find that when the left hand has been cut Ehat Abbas did not still let go of the water bag and now he is holding the bag with the teeth with his mouth look at the courage of this personality and we find we find Abdul Fazbas is still moving forward his horse is still heading forward until Harmala is the person who is throwing another arrow at that time pointing towards the water bag of Sakina and the water goes down then now we don't find in the narration that Abbas alayhi salam still moves forward towards the Khayma why would he want to go forward now and now when Abbas alayhi salam is attacked from various sides and he fell down over the ground and Maidan of Karbala. Isn't that right? Ayatullah Sibawai, who used to, used to lead the prayers in the haram of Abu al Abbas, he saw him in the dream and Ab Abbas Aysa was asking him about his Masaib. He said, Mawla, what Masaib are you talking about? I keep on reading your Musibat. I keep on reading that. Which one is you talking about? And, 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 and Abbas Aysalam replies back to him that every Shaheed of Karbala, when he he used to fall down when he fell down over the ground. He had his hands there. When I fell down, my hands were cut off. So all the arrows again penetrated into my body. This is Abul Fazl Abbas. And now when Hazrat Zainab is waiting for Hazrat Abbas to come back and Imam Hussein tells her he is not going to come back in other words. I'm paraphrasing. And now, uh, Zainab replies back, My dad used to kiss my hands. <laughs> that the rope will be tied up in your hands. Now the time has arrived. That the rope will be tied over my hands. Obviously a sister like Zainab, who has a brother like Abbas, who can dare tie up the hands of Zainab in the presence of Abbas. But now that he becomes Shaheed, Zainab realizes 
this is the time the time has arrived when her hands will be tied up in the rope and now when Imam al Hussein we find Imam al Hussein gets closer goes towards towards Abu al-Fazl Abbas salam, when Imam moves towards him he says that statement that was never said for any other person in Karbala Imam says Al-an in kasara wahri wa qallat hilati. now my back has been broken and my tadbir and plan has been decreased Imam Hussein also said for only and only Abu al-Fazl Abbas salam, the only shaheed of Karbala for whom Mawla Imam Hussain had said Binafsi anta may my life be sacrificed on you when Imam Hussain says that for Abu al Abbas even if the whole universe gets sacrificed for him it is still less look at the azamat of Abu al Abbas he is the only individual only shaheed of Karbala because for every shaheed Prophet himself was arriving in the final moments and providing he was there and the drink of kawsar was being provided at that time Abbas salam, is the only shaheed Ayatollah Jafar Shustari says he's the only shaheed of Karbala when the drink was provided on behalf of the Holy Prophet he refused to drink the drink of kawsar from the fountain of kawsar because as long as Imam Hussain is thirsty how can Abbas quench his thirst that is the reason Allah gave him the laqab and title of Babul Hawa'i Ala laqnatullah ala alqawm al-zalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina ظلموا أيام قلبي قلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون إلهي بحق الزهراء وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين واخذل الكفار والمنافقين اللهم انصر من نسر الدين واخذل من خذل المسلمين اللهم انصر واحفظ وأيد علماءنا الربانيين ومراجعنا الربانيين لا سيما الولي الفقيه قائد المسلمين اللهم انصر جيوش المسلمين وعساكر الموحدين اللهم فك عن الأسراء المسلمين اللهم وفق لما تحب وترضى وعجل في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان واجعلنا من أنصاره وأشياعه وأتباعه وأعوانه بجاه محمد وآله الطاهرين لسوي الدعاية الكريمة for all the mu'mineen especially those who have sponsored all these majalis and sponsored the food and did any sort of service in the love of Ahlul Bayt and all those who are ill and those who requested for dua and all the mustadafeen and mahrumeen and mazlumeen in the Islamic Ummah especially those who are defending the haram of Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayha A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Amman yujibul muhtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su' Amman yujibul muhtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su' Amman yujibul muhtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su' Amman yujibul muhtarra إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا حسين